to do it. Okay, there we go. All right, so, all right, so hi. Um, uh, so I know this uh, intro slide is very pretty, but I'm gonna move on to the next slide, which is to talk to you about what we all should have been doing ideally this weekend is gathering uh, in person at D Acres Permaculture Farm in Dorchester, New Hampshire. Wonderful place, a place where I actually was several days ago uh, meeting with Josh Trout, and this is one of my sites where I planted edible natives for my nursery to supplement the huge number of edible wild plants that are already in this site. Uh, if you count the stuff that I planted, uh, there's over 95 species of edible wild plants. Of course, this includes edible weeds, edible non-native plants, edible invasive species, uh, as well as uh, edible natives. So, um, so it would have been a great place to do a walk with you. That was our original plan to have me do a, uh, a weed walk at D Acres as part of this conference. So sorry, uh, that did not materialize. So your consolation prize is to do this online workshop with me where I talk about edible native species. So I had proposed this to the uh, program committee uh, as a talk that I could give and it got uh, very legitimately bumped off the schedule because of all the other really wonderful talks that uh, were queued up. And um, because uh, I'll have to say that what I'm going to talk about today is somewhat tangential to permaculture. Uh, where it overlaps is the fact that we love to grow food. And I'm going to talk about uh, why you might want to consider some native edible species in addition to everything else you're growing. So in no way am I saying don't grow all the wonderful uh, edible crops like uh, apples and peaches and pears and the other stuff that might not be native to this region, but is really great. So yes, absolutely grow that stuff. But uh, perhaps after seeing this show, you might uh, be inspired to add a few native plants to that. So, uh, so before I go into the show any further, let me just say that this show has been tweaked just slightly from a show that I typically give to uh, homeowners and managers of conservation land that are very ecologically focused. And when they're thinking about planting on their properties, they're often focused on native plants and for the ecological reasons. So I'm gonna begin my talk with that and then we'll go and get into the edible stuff. All right, so if this were live program, I'd be asking you if there was anybody in the audience that hasn't heard of Doug Talamy. There he is right there. So. The way that I describe him is as a seminal role as Al Gore and, uh, and Bill McKibben have played in raising the public consciousness about climate change for our, and our need for us to deal with it. That's what this guy, Doug Talamy, has done for native plants. He's an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and he has very astutely observed that when our birds, our wonderful cherished birds, especially our, our neotropical migrant birds arrive in New England from the wintering grounds and they build their nests and they lay their eggs and the eggs hatch and the babies are clamoring for food, what are the parent birds feeding them? And it turns out they're feeding them caterpillars and they're gathering those caterpillars mostly from native plants. Why is that? Here's the major reason. Since plants can't move, their major defense is chemical. And so our native insects have co-evolved with the native plants and they figured out ways to get around those chemical defenses. So the plants and the insects are in dynamic equilibrium. They're uh, coexisting happily together. Uh, so that's all fine. But when people plant non-native plants, uh, they tend not to host uh, caterpillars because the non-native plants are not recognized by our native insects as food. And so uh, they're basically food deserts for birds, large areas where non-native plants have been planted. So this would not be so much a permaculture farm, which still has wonderful plants for pollinators and stuff like this. This is more like your conventional foofy ornamental landscaping that most homeowners do, where all they care about is what it looks like and they don't care about anything else. And so that's the usual people that I'm talking to. All right, so um, let's plunge on to the topic and talk a little bit more about uh, native species and the movement to plant native species. So Doug Tallamy is, is, is uh, the chief cheerleader for that, but there's lots of other people involved. Here's his newest book, Nature's Best Hope. And basically he says in this book that nature's best hope is all of us in terms of all of us that have control of the area around our houses and properties, stuff like that. We can start planting native to support uh, the ecology. So that's his major role. So 
lots of different nonprofit organizations and states have uh, gotten the message and they're very much interested in getting people to plant native and so they're putting out wonderful outreach materials printed publications other things online uh, really useful stuff talking about why ecologically it's important to plant native plants so several years ago, I went to a talk given by a wonderful woman named Kate Venturini from Rhode Island. And her uh, work at the time was working with homeowners along the shore in Narragansett Bay to get them to plant native plants to help absorb the pollutants coming off the parking lots and the lawns and stuff like that to help uh, filter the pollution before it got into the bay, keep the bay cleaner. So uh, very important objective. So uh, she had a chart like this in her talk, and I went up to her, and, and those of you that have ever ordered plants online, uh, been to nursery web pages and stuff, charts like this are really common, where you see the name of the plant on the left side, and then you see the, all these attributes on the right side, like grows tall, grows short, like sun, like shade. So I went up to Kate at the end of her talk, and I said, Kate, where's your edibility column? And she said, oh, we don't tell people that. And I said, why not that? Why, why don't you tell people? She said, we don't want people to eat these plants. We want them to leave them for the wildlife. And I said, oh, that's interesting. You have blueberry on your list. Are you suggesting that people plant blueberry plants and then never go out and pick a blueberry themselves? Oh, we wouldn't do that. So I said, you might as well tell them what else is edible. So now in Rhode Island, they do. They have an edibility column on their native plants page. So here's the important point I make to the folks that are so fixated on planting native plants, the fact that many of our native plants are edible by people too provides an additional powerful incentive for people to add them to their landscapes that might be insufficiently induced to do so just in the pure ecological argument. So pardon me while I dwell on stereotypes for just a minute. Uh, so in my mind, I imagine a suburban couple, a husband and wife owning a, uh, a house with a yard around it. And the wife has heard Doug, Doug Tallamy's talk. She's read his book. So she's convinced, oh, it's really important for us to plant native plants in our yard. And the husband says, I like the yard the way it is. I don't want to change anything. And that's where she could bring him to one of my talks or, uh, you know, uh, get other materials to talk about edible native plants. And I will freely admit that this one uh, factor alone is not going to get everyone to rip out their lawn and put in edible la landscaping or native edible plants. But my hunch is that it can win an additional group of people that aren't sold and just the pure, we need to do it for the bugs and the bunnies argument. Okay, so the rest of this talk is about edible native plants. And uh, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about, about uh, 34 specific species that I think are worth considering for planting in people's yards and uh, and perhaps some of them you will agree with me are suitable for a permaculture setup as well. All right, so how do you figure out if a plant is native? Here is a wonderful resource on the left side. This is the Go Botany webpage that the Native Plant Trust maintains and you can pull up any species and over here on this map you see a line with uh, uh, a map of New England with uh, these black outlines on it. So these are county boundaries. And if it's colored green, that tells you that a particular species is documented to occur naturally in that county. And so that's uh, one thing to check. If this color were pink, that would tell you that the plant is deemed to be non-native to that county. Doesn't mean it's not edible, doesn't mean it's not worth planting, but it just means if you're focused on, you wanna know what's native or not, this is a, a great resource to tell you. Then there's the subject of ecoregions, which um, I'm sure a lot of you are well versed in, but of course plants don't look at political boundaries to decide where to grow. They're growing in their suitable habitats and on a macro scale, these can be sorted into these ecoregions. Although within these ecoregions, of course, there's all kinds of uh, micro habitats and microclimates where you can push the envelope and plant stuff that ordinarily would grow further south and you might find a warm spot to put it in. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my talk. So uh, for example, black walnut has not been officially deemed to be native to Massachusetts. Of course, it grows uh, in most places in Massachusetts can be quite common and it is native to Connecticut. And you can see the Connecticut ecoregion uh, extends into Massachusetts. So this, these are the boundaries I tend to pay more attention to rather than just uh, somewhat arbitrary, at least to a plant's perspective, political boundaries. On the subject of ecotype, some people are very focused on ecotype and they uh, feel 
that you need to, if you're going to plant a native plant, you have to get a locally grown native plant that's from local seed. And it's really important to do this. Uh, and that you might be uh, uh, hurting an existing native plant growing in that area if you do introduce uh, a plants that don't have the local ecotype plant. And uh, I'm not sure I agree with that argument. I've heard it uh, argued very strongly on the other side that that's not so important. So let me just say in the subject of ecotype that if you are able to procure local ecotype seed or local ecotype plants for the place where you want to do the planting, I think it, it could be argued that the chances of those plants succeeding in the place where you're planting them might be higher because these are plants that are pre-adapted to grow in the conditions that you have. So I'll just put it that way. All right, and if you wanna know where to get native seed, this is one good source. There's a bunch of other ones, but uh, particularly if you're in Maine, this is a great source, the Wild Seed Project. And Wild Seed Project is a great source for all kinds of native seed, but there are they have edible native seeds too. So here's five species that um, uh, this uh, nonprofit organization has. And you, can, you buy these seeds in packets and then sow them, and you can get edible native plants that way. Um, and I've gotten uh, seed from this organization and sown it, and it's been great. But I also collect a lot of seed, and we'll be talking about that in the course of the show. All right, and another thing, and this is a great technique for homeowners, permaculturists have skills that are even more advanced than this, but at least for homeowners that want to know, how do I know what's suitable for my yard? Uh, this Native Plant Trust Plant Finder is a really good tool. So it's got a bunch of things that sorted by all kinds of attributes you can decide uh, I want a plant that looks this way, or I want a plant that grows in a wet habitat, dry habitat, sunny habitat, shady habitat. Uh, this can all tell you. So I queried the database and I got 80 results for edible. Uh, and as was mentioned before, there's over 180 species that are edible by people that grow in Northeast eco regions. So, but 80, that's a, a pretty good uh, example. So for example, if you click on sweet fern, so here's the page for sweet fern and it doesn't get into the details on edibility, but um, there's certainly other sources that do that, including me. Uh, but this shows you more details about where sweet fern likes to grow and a map showing you the states where sweet fern is considered to be native. So this is a really great resource, online resource, that gives people specific advice on what plants are suitable to grow in my yard. All right, so now that I've done that, I'm ready to talk about specific plants. So here we go. All right, so. Uh, many of you will know what this plant is. Some of you will not. Probably you all know that this is a fiddlehead. A fiddlehead is the stage in the life of a fern. And one of the biggest mistakes that novice foragers make is they'll be walking in the woods in the spring and they'll see a bunch of ferns at this curled up fiddlehead stage and they'll say, oh, fiddleheads, it looks just like what I've seen for sale in the stores. It must be the same thing. So they pick it and they bring it home and they cook it up and it tastes horrible and they say, yuck, where do we go wrong? Where they went wrong is they harvested the wrong species of fern. I only know of two species of fern that grow in New England and only one that's safe to eat in quantity, and that's this one. And this is the ostrich fern. This is indeed the fiddlehead fern that you see for sale in the stores. And uh, while there might be a little bit of cultivating of this fern going on, and I hope there will be more, and perhaps this talk will encourage more to happen, most of the fiddleheads you see for sale in the stores are collected from the wild. And this could be problematic if people don't do it in a sustainable way. So, um, so on the subject of edible native species, let me say that I encourage folks when you're gathering native plants in the wild that you use forbearance and restraint to make sure that you don't upset the ecological balance in any way, because these plants often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food and some other important portion of their life cycle. So I encourage you to respect that. So in the case of ostrich fern fiddleheads, I'd recommend littering yourself to one or maybe two of the curled up parts per clump. That's it. Because unfortunately, what some people will do that are thinking short term and just the immediate, I need to convert these plants to cash, I've got a mortgage payment to make or whatever, uh, they'll go ahead and they'll pick every single one. And the plant will hold a few fiddleheads in reserve and those will pop out a week or so later. But if somebody goes into the woods and picks all those, you could sap a lot of strength from the rhizome. You could actually kill the plant by harvesting it that hard. So just one or two of the curled up parts per clump. 
that's the way to do it. All right, so to know uh, whether you have the ostrich fern as opposed to the other species of fern, the first thing I look for is habitat. The ostrich fern prefers this alluvial floodplain soil. This photo was taken along the Connecticut River in Massachusetts, but you see this a lot in the rivers in northern New England too, uh, Merrimack River, Upper Connecticut River, the tributaries to the Connecticut River. That's its natural habitat. You can get it to grow in other places like that but it's unlikely that you would find an ostrich fern fiddlehead in really rocky soil on the top of a mountain, stuff like that. That's not the right habitat for it. Also, to distinguish the ostrich fern from other species, you'll notice that uh, these fiddleheads are growing in a vase-shaped clump, so look for that. And then if we cut these stems in cross-section, you'd see that they form a U-shape like a celery stalk, so look for that. And then, uh, fifth thing to look for, so there's the vase-shaped clump on these maturing larger fronds, you can really see it now. The fertile fronds, the spore-bearing fronds, often come out in pairs. Not every clump of fiddleheads is gonna have them, but you frequently will see them in the patch. And if you cut those little stems, they also have that U-shaped uh, gouge running in them. So if you see all five of those characteristics in the patch of fiddleheads you're looking at, those are ostrich ferns, and those are edible. You have to cook them, cook them thoroughly, because if you undercook them, they contain an enzyme called thiaminase, which actually breaks down vitamin B1 in your body, so you can develop a vitamin B1 deficiency. So uh, here's a neat trick. If you've ever bought fiddleheads at a farmer's market and you weren't impressed with the flavor, uh, you need to think of them as sweet corn and minimize the amount of time between gathering the, the fiddleheads and eating them. And this was amply demonstrated to me by this woman, Beth Basler, who took a bunch of us to a patch of ostrich ferns growing along the Connecticut River. And she took her camp stove with her to the fiddlehead patch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them. And they were truly exquisite that way. So that's how I'd recommend eating them. All right, and uh, fiddleheads, uh, ostrich ferns are sold by a lot of nurseries. So you don't have to be a specialist permaculture nursery to find these or a native plant nursery. And these plants will split, spread vegetatively. And so uh, once you get them going, uh, they will spread. And there's probably a little bit of spreading going on by spores too, uh, but definitely vegetatively. And so here's just a suburban person's yard with the fiddleheads just growing on the edge of the yard. and. I would wager that these people have no clue that the fiddleheads from these uh, ostrich ferns are edible. They just grew them because they thought it was a ground cover that would grow in damp shade. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a plant that will grow outside of its naturally preferred habitat. So I think it's an excellent thing to consider if you uh, have a place like that, you'd like to uh, plant a plant like this. All right, so this species right here, you may know from sight. It's a plant that's native to uh, most of the eastern north, uh, uh, eastern part of the country. Uh, I believe that the city named Chicago and Winooski, Vermont, were named from Native American words for this plant. So it's a plant that uh, has been in our landscape for thousands of years. So Native Americans obviously extensively used it for food. And country people know this plant, I'm sure. Uh, some has been traditionally gathered for a long time by folks living out in the country. Uh, while they're out trout fishing or turkey hunting, things like that, they pick this plant. So this is a plant that the New England name is wild leek, but more recently it's been more well known by its Southern Appalachian name, which are ramps. So this plant uh, has been in our landscape in relative obscurity until about 15 years ago when all of a sudden it experienced a meteoric rise in popularity because the chefs and the foodies started hyperventilating about it. So what that has unfortunately uh, led to is a kind of a gold rush mentality in the part of some people where they'll go into the woods and they'll see a patch of the wild leeks like this and they'll dig up every single plant and completely wipe it out. So there are places in Western Mass, for example, where I used to see patches of the wild leeks growing where they are completely gone. So obviously that's not a sustainable way of harvesting. So uh, in fact, uh, if you're gonna gather these plants from the wild, the, uh, uh, I'm gonna tell you a sustainable way of harvesting them. So here's a close up of what the plants look like. So this is in the spring, this is, uh, uh, mid to late April to mid-May is when you're going to encounter the plants like this. So the little scallion-like bulbs are below the ground. And what the people selling these plants typically do is they dig up the entire thing. And in my view, that's not a sustainable way of interacting with this plant. The leaves are delicious, and you can just enjoy the leaves and leave the bulb in the ground. In fact, 
my recommended method is to limit your harvesting to one leaf per plant, leave the remaining leaf attached to the bulb, leave the bulb in the ground. That's a totally sustainable way of interacting with these plants. The patches will continue to thrive into the future. And one nice thing about not disturbing the ground and creating any bare soil, because when you do that, you create the ideal opportunity for the invasive species like garlic mustard and the other plants to uh, come into the habitat that the wild leeks like to grow in, which is a, a rich woods habitat that they share with a lot of cherished spring ephemeral wildflowers like trilliums and bloodroots and stuff like that. So I recommend the no dig harvesting method, one leaf per plant harvesting method. All right. But there's another piece of good news besides the fact that you don't have to dig up a wild leek to eat it. And that is, oh, so I'm just going to skip this slide and talk about growing plants. Uh, um, you can propagate ramps. So this photo was taken from the stock bed at Garden of the Woods. This is in Framingham. So this is a native plant garden uh, where they also sell plants. And what they do there is they have several of these stock beds that they have planted very, very thickly with the wild leeks. And they're able to pull out a certain percentage every season and then let that um, uh, raised bed lie fallow for a couple of years while they harvest from the other ones. And then they can pot the plants up and then sell them to people to buy them uh, retail at their store uh, with other native plants. And then people can establish their own wild leek patch, their own ramp patch in their own yards, uh, which is great. And of course, I would uh, heartily encourage people to do that. But if you do that, I bet you're not going to dig up the plants in your yard because that would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. No, you'd leave the plants there, harvest one leaf per plant, and then you'd have a sustainable way of harvesting the plants in your yard. So, so one thing uh, that permaculturalists could do if you want to have a source for wild leeks that's other than uh, depleting them from the wild by digging them up, you could uh, establish these stock beds. There's no reason if a native plant, a nursery, uh, and garden can do it that a permaculture farm could also replicate what they're doing. The big challenge is getting started with a lot of plants because you can grow these plants from seed. They're very slow. So you need to find an ethical way to populate their stock bed. Uh, but if you're able to do that, then you're in business. It'd be great. Okay, so here's another edible native plant that most native plant folks are very focused on the ecology of this plant, and it is very important. I'll talk about that next. But milkweed is a wonderfully edible native species. It's got at least four edible parts that uh, happen chronically, chronologically in succession. So if you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while until the next edible stage develops. There's a whole chapter on milkweed in my foraging book, which I'll talk about at the end of this talk. And, um, and there's a good recipe, which I'll talk about in just a second. So milkweed shoots are edible. The, lead, the cluster leaves off the slightly older shoots are edible. The milkweed flower buds are edible when they're in a tight green cluster like this in this photo. And I, my recommended cooking method for milkweed is to boil whatever milkweed part you're, you, you want to eat, boil it for seven minutes and then pour off the water. Now, other people claim they can use other cooking methods. I will just tell you that this one that I do uh, works very well and results in uh, totally safe to eat as much as you want final product. So here in this bowl to the right are milkweed buds that have been cooked for seven minutes and look how well they held up. They didn't get uh, uh, shrink or get mushy on you. In fact, they look even better than they did on the plant in the raw stage. So you could just eat these as a uh, just a side dish, vegetable side dish, or one way to use them that works really well is this recipe from my book, which is called Milkweed Egg Puff, which is like a cross between a souffle and a casserole, and they're very good that way. And even the milkweed pods, and this is the stage a lot of plants are in now in the Northeast, when the pods are about an inch and a half long or smaller, uh, and nice and firm to the touch, you boil them for seven minutes and then the texture and the flavor is very similar to green beans. All right, so all that's great, but here is the monarch caterpillar to remind us that uh, common milkweed and the other plants in the Asclepius genus are really important ecologically because that's what the monarch butterfly uh, females seek out to lay their eggs on and the caterpillars are eating these plants. So it's really important we leave lots of milkweed plants in the landscape. In fact, I would encourage anybody that has any opportunity whatsoever to plant milkweeds. So let me show you how I've done that. So here is my uh, house on a 4,500 square foot lot in suburban Arlington, Massachusetts. So there's my car, there's my boat right there, and here's my, uh, my blueberry bushes. And I planted the milkweed just right along the blueberry bushes. And so uh, these plants come out 
uh, in May and you can start harvesting them right away. So I would harvest the plants uh, at the shoot stage. I would harvest the plants, the leaves off the slightly older shoot stage. And uh, now, isn't that taking food away from the monarchs? No, it isn't. And here's the trick that you can use. There's a wonderful website called Journey North. It's a citizen science project where the citizens document the occurrence of monarch butterflies once they arrive in their area. And so you can just check this web page and see, okay, are the monarch butterflies here yet? No, I can eat the milkweed then. Because if you pick the milkweed, these plants have uh, tap roots, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you know, very fleshy rhizomes that immediately send up another shoot. As soon as you mow or you took this off to eat it, uh, they'll re-sprout. So this is a plant that can be cropped several times like asparagus. And once you see on the Journey North website that the monarch butterflies are in your area, that's when I would stop harvesting whole plants and let the plants grow out so that they're available for the monarch butterflies to find them and lay eggs on them. And this has happened at my yard. So here's a female butterfly that found the milkweed plants on my yard and laid an egg. And here's the chrysalis that attached the door of my garage and happily it attached to a spot where the garage door went up and down. It didn't dislodge the chrysalis. So, and then this was on there for several weeks. And then one day we went out and it was empty and the butterfly matured and flown away. So, uh, so I hope this kind of thing can be replicated by homeowners all over the place. And as I say, you know, it's a native uh, plant with important ecological value that we can eat too. All right, so here's a plant called carrion flower. And this one's fun to eat. It sends up shoots in the spring that look a lot like asparagus. You harvest it like asparagus, so you snap the top off. You cook it like asparagus. It tastes like asparagus. It's related to asparagus, so how cool is that? It's a native plant called carrion flower. And so here we are out camping. We're using a Frisbee as a plate. And you see these little spherical things. So I'm about to tell you why this plant is called carrion flower. These little spherical things are the flower buds. And uh, when they open up, they look like that, and that's when you discover why this plant is called carrion flower, because this plant smells like dirty socks or uh, 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 rotting meat when it's blooming. And so if you encounter the plant when it's blooming, it can be a rather unpleasant experience, but if you harvest it before it blooms, uh, the shoots are quite tasty. And I thought of the edible native species, this was also worth mentioning in a permaculture talk because of this plant, which a lot of you know, obviously, as pawpaw. Pawpaw is also planted by carrion flies. And so some permaculturalists will plant carrion flower as another nectaring source for the carrion flies to help uh, encourage and nurture a population of carrion flies that will be available to also visit the pawpaw flowers too. So that's great. All right, so speaking of pollinators, here's a native edible species that's really important with pollinators. I'll talk about that in just a second. So this is our native basswood, the Tilia americana, but all species of Tilia are edible the exact same way. So whether it's this one or Tilia cordata, which is a really common street tree in the city, edible the same way. So the young leaves are edible, straight into your mouth if you want. You can make sandwiches with them. They're relatively mild. And then the flowers are edible and you make a tea from the flowers and the tea is delicious and it also has two medicinal values and soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. And although when people are focused on planting pollinator plants, they're usually looking at herbaceous perennials, plants that are two or three feet tall. We have trees that are important for pollinators and this is one of our native trees that serves that function. So when the basswood flowers are blooming, you can hear the trees before you see them because there's so many bees and other pollinators visiting the flowers when they're blooming, the trees will buzz and you can hear them before you see them in the landscape. So yes, so these, uh, the tea you make from these blossoms tastes good and it also, um, if I didn't mention this, I'll mention it again. Uh, it's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state. So herbalists are very fond of this plant. It's very popular medicinal tea in Europe. All right, so here's the genus Amelanchia. So this is shadbush, serviceberry, shadblow, juneberry, all common names for the same thing. There are at least eight species that are deemed to be native to New England. They hybridize, so it's hard to tell them apart. It isn't necessary to tell them apart at all because they all produce edible fruits. So I just lump them all together. If you want to encounter these, the best time to look for them is the spring when they're blooming because they bloom early and you can spot them a landscape easier then. And then you want to go back and visit those spots in June or in Northern New England, July, when the fruit is ripe. And that's what the fruit looks like. 
Uh, so this is a close-up of the fruit. So they look like blueberries, but they don't really taste like blueberries. They taste like a cross between cherries and almonds. Uh, and they are actually all related. Cherries, almonds, and Juneberries are all related. They're related members in the rose family. So this is a fun tree for stuffing your face right by the tree. And, and yes, songbirds like to eat these fruits, but the typical shad bush is 12 or more feet tall. And often you can find them covered from head to toe with these ripe fruit. And let the songbirds fly up in the upper branches and eat that fruit. And you can pick the fruit from the lower branches. And often there's tons of fruit and you can all pig out and have a great time. So, and by the way, you don't have to be way off in the wilderness somewhere to pick from wild plants. So Juneberries is one of the plants that landscapers of parks and other landscaped areas will deploy, I think because of the early blooms of the flowers. And so this is a shot I took from a park right near downtown Boston where I used to work. And I would pick quarts of these uh, Juneberries on my lunch hours. So, so as I said, these are great for eating uh, straight into your mouth. They also dry very well. And then you can add them to granola. So in my book, I've got a couple recipes for uh, Juneberries and strudel is a good way to use them. So Juneberries is one of the species I've grown from seed and it's very easy. I think any of you could do this. So when the fruit was ripe um, uh, a month ago, I picked it. Oh, uh, so sorry, fruit was ripe a month ago, but it wasn't, uh, the seeds from this year aren't ready yet. So this is previous years. I would pick the fruit in late June, early July, eat the fruit, spit the seeds into my hand, and then put the seeds into a plastic baggie and put it in my fridge. And that's called stratification, which is an important uh, step to take for a lot of native seeds because they need to go through a cold period. Basically, you're simulating a winter in your fridge and uh, they need to go through an extended cold period to break their dormancy. So what can happen sometimes with the Juneberry seeds is in February, they'll wake up and the little radicals start coming out of the seeds. And when this happens, you have to sow them right away. So you can sow them in little growing medium and just stick it in a windowsill and then they'll start growing there. And then when they get, when the weather warms up, you can move them outside. And so I have Juneberry plants that I grew from seed that I gathered from fruit I picked in a park that are now over two feet tall in my nursery. All right, so wild strawberry, I think just about anybody has a place to plant wild strawberry in your property. So anybody certainly with a lawn, this is a great way to diversify your lawn from just plain grass because wild strawberry doesn't mind getting mowed, doesn't mind getting stepped on. Uh, and you have these wonderful white flowers that the pollinators like to visit. And then, uh, of course, the delectable fruits that come three or four weeks after the pollinators. So this is an easy one to grow from seed. And also, uh, these plants are stoloniferous, like spider plants, the house plants, as they send out the little runners on the little uh, shoots. And you can just uh, snap those off. And usually, at the end of the little runner is a little baby uh, wild strawberry that's already got uh, a, a, a rudimentary root system. So all you have to do is just stick that in some uh, moist soil, and off you go. And there's your new strawberry plant. So uh, you can make tea from wild strawberry leaves when the leaves are fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea you make from the leaves does taste vaguely like the fruit and it does have vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you could rush out and make yourself some wild strawberry tea. So I like to share seed when I have an opportunity to do this. So in this case, I gave some of my wild strawberry seed to this girl's school out in the Berkshires. And you see, they repurposed a clamshell that you, you know, buy your fruit in from the, the store. And they put the growing medium in there and they sowed the wild strawberry seed in there and they got the plants to grow and they got big enough. So they were able to sell the wild strawberry plants along with their broccoli starts and the other things they sold at their spring plant sale that spring. And, and they tell me the wild strawberry plants sold very very well. So I think uh, anybody that does that, that grows uh, vegetable starts, organic farms and other folks, uh, and want to consider, you know, well, what native plants could we grow? Wild strawberry would be an excellent choice, I think, for that. All right, so the genus Rubus has got uh, lots and lot, lots of members in it. They're all edible. They're all pretty much usable the exact same way. Let me talk about a couple native species of the Rubus genus. So this is our flowering raspberry, gorgeous looking plant, a plant worth planting if all you did was look at it, even if you didn't eat it. These enormous maple-like leaves, these really, really pretty magenta colored flowers, and, uh, and the plant doesn't have thorns. So this is what the uh, flowering raspberry fruits look like. I will admit that a regular red raspberry is probably a tastier fruit. These are a bit on the dry side. 
but they're absolutely edible. And occasionally you can find a lot of these. If you've got especially a damp, slopey site with dappled sunlight, that's where the flowering raspberry uh, uh, likes to grow. So I recommend it for those places. All right, here's the black raspberry. I don't need what to tell I don't need how to tell you how to use a black raspberry. I can trust you'll figure that on your own. I will tell you that one interesting attribute of this species is what it does during the off season is this uh, little waxy covering that covers the canes turns purple in the off season. So really helps you find these plants if you don't already know where they are. So it could be February in the middle of the winter with the snow in the ground. You're out cross country skiing, walking your dog, whatever. You see these thorny purple colored canes. Those are black raspberries. Remember where they are and then go get them in uh, late June, early July, depending upon where you are and then harvest them. All right, here's the common elderberry. There's also a red elderberry that grows primarily in northern New England that has pyramidical shaped flowers and red berries. As far as you know, that plant is not edible. This one is edible. Some people will collect the flowers and they make a drink from them. There's an alcoholic version and a non-alcoholic version. Um, uh, and some people will fry these flowers in fritter batter, but there's a, another species that I think much makes much tastier fritters, a species that isn't in this show, but is often in my uh, wild plant shows, and that is a species called black locust, and the black locust flowers make a really excellent fritter. There's a chapter on black locust in my book uh, with that fritter recipe in it. So anyway, so here are the elderberry plants, and um, uh, I'm going to uh, skip the next part of this talk just to get to the elderberry berries. So this is uh, what the um, uh, plants produce if you leave the flowers on the plant. So if you're picking the flowers off, you're not going to get any berries there. So I tend to leave the uh, berries on the plant. And uh, these will be ripe toward the end of the summer, so like beginning of September. And... Um, and I understand you can get a stomach ache if you eat a lot of uh, raw elderberries, but if you dry them first or you cook them first, you can eat as many as you want. And I like to make, mix elderberries and apples together. So elderberry apple sauce, elderberry apple pie is more interesting than just plain applesauce and apple pie. All right, and it's very easy to grow elderberries from seed. Let me just mention that one thing I tend not to do is grow plants from cuttings, but an elderberry is a plant that I understand is very easy to grow from cuttings that practically all you have to do is just take a section of the elderberry stem and stick it in the ground and it will grow roots and grow elderberries for you. And if you're dealing with a named variety or cultivar that might have uh, extra large uh, seed heads or uh, fruit heads or extra large um, uh, berries, uh, that would be one way to make sure that what you get is uh, uh, the same. But I have grown these, oops, I'm going the wrong direction. Didn't want to talk to you about that. All right, so anyway, you can grow elderberries from seed. It is very easy. So I stratify the seed like I do the wild strawberry and then I sowed it in January uh, and then I sowed it in, in a solar room indoors because uh, I just was uh, eager to get started. But you can absolutely sow these outdoors, how it happens in nature. And then they start growing in this little pot. And eventually, they get so big, they begin to get pot bound. So here's the roots coming out of the bottom of the pot. So when you see that, it's time to do something. Now, some people will dump the contents of the pot out and prick apart these plants and give them their own separate place to go, and that's fine. But another technique that works really well is just to take the entire contents of the pot and just plop it in a new pot that has additional room for the roots to grow. And then the plants can continue to get bigger while still being in a pot. And eventually, of course, these will get root bound too. And at that point, you dump out the contents of the pot and prick the plants out and then give them uh, uh, more space to grow in either in additional pots or in the locations where you want them to grow. All right, so we've got a bunch of native mints that are edible, and I'm gonna talk about two right now. So mints fall into two basic culinary categories. There's the sweet mints and the savory mints. And the sweet mints are like peppermint and spearmint, where you use them for mint tea, mint jelly, mint juleps, mint ice cream, stuff like that. And then there's the savory mints that are more like sage and thyme, where you use them for pizza topping, 
uh, soups, omelets, casseroles, stuff like that. So that's, in my opinion, where this wild bergamot belongs. Because if you take a leaf and scrunch it up and sniff it, it smells and tastes just like oregano. So that's how I would use this. And um, this is a native plant. It's easy to grow from seed. And uh, this is a great plant to consider adding to a landscape if you've got a lot of other plants growing that you're not very keen on and you wouldn't mind if a plant with a somewhat assertive growing habit, which even the native mints also have, gets in there and takes over a little bit. So uh, that's what the Monarda fistulosa can do for you. And of course, the ecologists love this plant because it's a native species to the Northeast. And like uh, most other mints, it's very popular with pollinators. So even more popular with pollinators is this species. So this is the uh, Pycnanthema muticum. And this one I'd put in the sweet category because these leaves right here are very pepperminty. And this flower right here of all the plants I'm growing in my nursery is the one that attracts the most and the most diverse pollinators of anything I'm growing. So like these uh, great blue wasps, these things that are an inch and a half long and look kind of scary, but they're not interested in you or stinging you or hassling you. They just want to collect uh, uh, the pollen or the nectar from these plants. So uh, uh, so this is the, the one of our mountain mints that's worth considering planting um, uh, in uh, you know a diverse assemblage of other plants. All right, spice bush, a native plant that um, uh, I recommend for folks that have uh, shady, damp habitat, uh, especially where the soil is rocky and they've got uh, hardwood trees where they can plant this under, and especially where there's a, a perennial or intermittent stream nearby, because that's the typical habitat where you see spice bush growing. It will happily grow in other areas beyond that, but that's the ideal spice bush habitat. And this is one of our native species the American colonists turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era when they were boycotting the British tea. They would just steep the twigs in hot water for a few minutes. And you could certainly do that. And um, uh, so that's one edible part of the plant. The other edible part that I like to use are these berries. And I will collect the berries in September when they're ripe and I dry them. So I just spread them out in a cookie sheet. I don't have to use a food dehydrator or anything. And I just ignore them for three or four weeks. And then they turn this uh, reddish brown color. So they lose that beautiful red uh, color. But at this stage, you can store them in a little glass jar in your pantry. and They'll keep for years without going rancid. And then when I want to use these, I just uh, put a few in a mortar and pestle and grind them up. And it's a savory spice. So it's more like a cross between Szechuan peppercorns and black peppers. That's how I use it. So in that milkweed puff, uh, egg puff that I talked about earlier in the show, I use the pulverized dried spice bush recipe, uh, berries in that recipe. It works really well. All right, but going back to the ecological value of this plant, this, these berries are very high in lipids, that's a vegetable fat, and our migrating native songbirds know this, and so they seek out these berries to fatten up and fuel themselves for their southward migration. So it's really important if you're gonna gather spice bush berries for the wild, from the wild, that you leave lots of berries on the plants to make sure that the migrating songbirds get all they need, okay? So I hope you've heard me on that. Uh, and, um, and another tricky thing is if you're, if you want to buy spice bush plants at a nursery, uh, mostly, most nurseries can't tell you what gender the plants are because they're usually not big enough to actually start blooming when you could tell them apart, which is male, which is female. So my advice is if you have the room, plant multiple spice bush plants to the chances are that you will get a female that produces these berries. Another uh, nice attribute to spice bush is this is one of our native species that the deer aren't fond of. So uh, if you have a problem where the deer are browsing excessively on your landscape, this is a plant you might want to consider. Okay, last but not least, another reason why spice bush is a really cool plant to have in the landscape is, oh, I forgot to tell you, <laughs> important part of this talk, you can grow spice bush from seed, which I have done. So don't dry the berries out, because if you dry the berries out, uh, these seeds will lose their viability. So any spice bush berries you want to save for growing seed from, stratify it, store it in your fridge. Uh, the flesh will rot off the berries and then store berries like this in your fridge. I usually add a little vermiculite in the plastic bag and they go into the fridge and then you sow them. And if you sow them outside, absolutely, absolutely put this metal mesh, half inch mesh hardware cloth over the flat where you're sowing the seeds because otherwise the ravenous rodents will dig them up and clean you out. So I know there's some bitter experience. So 
please take my advice and cover your flats. In fact, I cover most of my flats, no matter what I'm sewing with this hardware cloth, just because I find that the squirrels and chipmunks are digging in there just out of curiosity. And so they're uprooting plants all the time. So I, I use a lot of this hardware cloth in my nursery. All right, yeah, so here's the other reason you might want to plant a spice bush plant. Uh, is it's the host plant for this really cool critter called the spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So when the egg first hatches and this caterpillar is about a half an inch long, it, just, it looks just like bird poop. So that's an effective disguise. And then as it gets bigger, as it's like an inch or an inch and a half long, it morphs into this form. These are fake eye patches. The real eyes are down here. The caterpillar is trying to impersonate a snake. So it, uh, that's an effective disguise. And even at the pupa stage, um, Look at this, it looks just like a leaf. So isn't this amazing that this organism has developed all kinds of ingenious disguises to avoid getting eaten? So that is the spice bush, swallowtail, butterfly, caterpillar, and pupa. All right, so wintergreen is a really common plant. And I guess if you've got acidic soil in your uh, permaculture garden or in your yard, and uh, especially if you've got um, pine trees this is an excellent ground cover under pine trees and yes the the plants have the wintergreen flavor especially these young leaves make a good wintergreen sun tea and the berries aren't that sweet but you can eat them too but if i were going to make a drink a, a wintergreen flavored drink i tend to make it from black or yellow birch and uh and this is something you could do year round is you just take these twigs and you peel them and you take the black or yellow birch peel twigs in the peelings. You just stick it in a jar of room temperature water and let it sit around for an hour. You don't have to put it out in the sun or anything. And then you get a nice strong wintergreen flavored beverage. And you can tap birch trees for sap, uh, any species of birch that's big enough, including paper birch, but gray birch. Uh, unfortunately, the sap is even waterier than maple sap and you have to boil the heck out of it to get anything. And what you eventually get looks and tastes just like molasses, uh, but, um, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense to uh, get molasses that way. But if let's say you were camping during the time of the year when the birch sap was flowing, which depending upon where you are, could be March, could be April, and you're concerned about the potability of the water supplies at the place where you're camping is you could tap the birch trees and get all the pure clean drinking water you needed that way. And you can grow birch trees from seed, which is really fun. And it's fun to collect the seed, which you can do in the middle of the winter. So the seed is discharged by these uh, structures called strobels. And this will continue to happen during the winter. So after a snowstorm, go out as you're walking your dog cross country skiing and look for these seeds on the top of the surface of the snow and collect them. And then you wanna sow them on the surface of some growing medium because these seeds need light to germinate and then they will start sprouting and then growing in little pots. And I have probably three dozen uh, foot and a half tall birch saplings in my nursery now from seed that I gathered in the winter underneath the snow, I mean, uh, on the surface of the snow. All right, so if this was a, a in-person talk, I'd be asking you, what is this plant? Some of you will know, some of you will not know. So I give you a big hint. I say, here's a boardwalk growing over a dune. Does that help you? And often that helps people to know this is beach plum. Now beach plum will happily grow away from the ocean. If you wanna find naturally occurring beach plum though, this is the place to look for it. It's near the dunes, near the ocean, is where you tend to find it most readily. I have seen it growing wild other places, but this is where it does uh, grow on its own. And the best time to find beach plums, if you don't already know where it is, and this is true with the shadbush too, is I look for the plants when they're blooming because they stand up for the landscape a lot better because when the bleach, beach plum fruit is ripe, it's this purple color and that's a hard color to see at a distance. So beach plums are small. They're about the size of Bing cherries. It's about as big as they get, but that's a good size for wild fruit. And they will vary in flavor from bush to bush. Sometimes they're puckery and astringent, and other times they're sweet and just about as good as any conventional plum. So I've had some beach plums that are so good, it's really fun to just stuff your face right by the tree. And, um, and so uh, every beach plum that I gather, I save that fruit and I, I, I'm sorry, I eat the fruit and I make stuff from it if whatever I don't eat right away, but I save the pits and I grow. Oh, so this is an example of beach plums growing from plants that were miles away from the ocean. So, uh, and, uh, and let me just mention while I'm thinking of it, one place I would love to see beach plums deployed more readily that uh, I've seen them work really well is 
at parking lots, just like a conventional strip mall parking lot where they got those little vegetated islands because the area around those islands get really hot and really dry. And that's what dunes are like. So I've seen beach plums thrive in places like that. So, uh, so that might be something worth considering uh, in a place that otherwise is rather inhospitable to plants. Okay, yes, so I'm making fun things from beach plum, like beach plum jam is a good thing. And then once you have the jam, you can do baked goods like rugula here on the right. And there is an orange variety of beach plum that I run into occasionally. I'm also trying to propagate this one from seed. And these orange fruits taste at least as good as the purple flower, purple uh, colored ones. Yes, yeah, so the beach plum seeds do what the um, um, Juneberry seeds do. They can be uh, uh, precocious and start sprouting in my stratification fridge early. So you can sow them early in the windowsill or whatever. And then, yes, I have beach plums now two feet tall in my nursery that I grew from seeds from fruit from pits that I just gathered from beach plums out there. All right. Viburnums. There are no poisonous species of viburnums. That's good. They don't all have yummy fruit, but there are a few with fruit that I consider yummy. So wild raisin is one of them. So it's the fruits like this that are uh, black with a bit of a purpley dust in the outside. Uh, they're edible. Uh, now these do have seeds in the center, so it's not like a raisin, you know, with small seeds. The seeds are large, uh, but uh, so you can swallow the seeds or spit them out. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then uh, these nanny berry fruits. So uh, these fruits are larger, and these also have a flat stone in the center, but the pulp around them is kind of like a stewed prune. So that's a, another um, uh, nice edible viburnum. And then this one, the hobble bush, and this is a species that uh, you're going to find in uh, cool, shady, dappled sun, slopey areas, um, mostly in northern New England. Uh, this is one of the species uh, I am a little concerned about, might see its natural range shrink a little bit as a result of climate change as our climate continues to warm. But even with that, I have deployed this landscape in the environment and I planted it in places where I am guessing there's going to be a cool microclimate will persist in spite of global warming. And the plants I put in are doing okay. So uh, I'm encouraged by that. So there's the fruit ripe in September. It tastes like uh, stewed prunes, a little bit of a clovey flavor. So it's really nice. I have struggled with growing this plant from seed. So I can't say this is an easy one. Uh, the wild raisin is much easier, but I'm going to continue with it till I figure out the secret of how, how to do it. So if any of you have any secrets you want to share with me, that's great. And hobble bush is a beautiful fall foliage plant. So you probably all know this, but any sumac with these tight upright clusters of red berries is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. That's what poison sumac berries look like, very similar to poison ivy berries. So unless you're looking at a sumac with berries like this, don't worry about it. So uh, staghorn sumac, um, wing sumac, and smooth sumac are the major three species of sumac you're likely to find here. This plant is a relative of the sumac that the sumac powder, the Middle Eastern powder, is made from. So I have had the powder made from our native sumacs. I didn't think it was good as the Middle Eastern variety, but I will tell you how I use this in cooking in just a second. So the main edible part on the sumac is the berries. It's actually flavoring off the berries that you um, um, uh, extract, and I will show you how I do this. So this is all explained in my book. So you take these berry clusters and you put them in some water and you're kneading them in the water and you're rubbing the flavor off the berries into the liquid and the liquid will turn this pinkish orange color. Get rid of the berries, take this liquid, put it through any kind of a filter like a paper towel, and then what goes through, you can drink sweet or unsweetened, hot or cold, and I typically drink it cold and sweetened like pink lemonade. So there it is, and the entire time it takes from picking the fruit off the plant to drinking the drink can be as little as a half an hour. And if I want to use sumac for cooking, like as a flavoring, like you'd use the sumac powder, I make an extra concentrated version of this sumac aid where it's extra sour and extra dense color, and I use that instead of the powdered sumac in cooking. All right, so here's the bit of advice that I give you. I strongly discourage you from throwing any of those sumac seeds in your compost unless you want to be picking out little sumac babies years and years and years afterwards. So it's eight years so far. I'm still finding little sumac babies growing 
where I deployed my quote unquote finished compost in my raised beds. So, so uh, uh, ordinarily putting native seeds in a compost is fine, but uh, I, I don't think it's wise with the sumac. All right, another great fall foliage plant. We've got several different kinds of native grapes that are wonderful. I don't want to deter you from growing cultivars or grapes in a permaculture garden, that's fine. But we, we do have some great native ones too. This is the fox grape, Vitus labrusca. This is actually what the conquer grape cultivar came from, this species here. Uh, I hope some of you have had the enjoyment of in September just uh, walking or riding your bike and all of a sudden going, grapes, grapes, where's that smell coming from? And following your nose to the vine and finding the ripe grapes and stuffing your face by the vine, which is a lot of fun. So I am typically filling up baskets with the fox grapes uh, every September. And you see this coppery, uh, finely woolly color in the underside of the grape. That's one of the ways to recognize the fox grape leaf. This color can be white too. And so these grapes, as I say, are great for eating out of hand or you can, um, uh, also um, make stuff from them and just throw them in a pot with some water and then simmer them for a while, put everything through a food mill or a sieve, and then the skins and the seeds are held back. And then what goes through, you can pour it into a tall container like a pitcher and the top part, once it settles, will be this delicious wild grape juice, which you can drink just plain. And then the bottom part is a puree, which you can use as raw material for making grape sorbet, grape chiffon pie, grape jam, grape jelly, grape cheesecake, like this right here. So that's really wonderful. Then another native species of wild grape we have that grows around here is called the Riverside grape. And this one does produce grapes too. They're smaller and they're kind of muskier flavored than the fox grape. So I don't think these grapes are as yummy, but it's this species that has a smooth and green underside to the leaf that some people that like to make the stuffed grape leaf recipes prefer over all their species. You can use any variety of grape leaf for stuffing but uh, this one is particularly good. So this is the time of year you wanna gather them in the spring, so way, way before any grapes are forming on the plants when the leaves are young and fully formed, uh, but nice and tender. So with a riverside grape leaves, I find that I only have to blanch these, drop the, these into boiling water for just 20 seconds to soften them enough to stuff them. And so there they are, stuffed grape leaves. And uh, it's really fun and hopefully, uh, in the near future, we'll be able to have company over for dinner parties and stuff like that. This is a really fun thing to serve to them uh, and tell them they're wild grape leaves that you picked and stuff yourself. Last thing I'll say about grape leaves is that if you make pickles, and this is a information that you can still apply now, if you make pickles and you take a grape leaf and you put it in each jar where you're putting the pickles are growing, those pickles will come out crisper because that grape leaf was in there. And I don't think it matters what variety of grape leaf you use. And it's a tartaric acid that's in the grape leaves that uh, helps accomplish that fact. Okay, hazelnut. So there are wonderful hazelnut filbert cultivars out there with large nuts. And if you wanna grow those, I wouldn't blame you because our native hazelnuts are considerably smaller, but we have two species of native hazelnuts that uh, I'm propagating from seed in my nursery. They do very well. Actually, uh, I haven't grown the beaked hazelnut. So this is what the beaked hazelnut looks like. So these I tend to see a little bit more Northern New England. So the developing nut is in here. And then you have the things straight, uh, uh, like the bird's beaks like, you know, here. The, uh, uh, common hazelnut has a thing that looks like the head of a cabbage. And you see how these are turning brown. This is really important tip. If you ever want to gather hazelnuts for the wild, do not wait till these husks fall off the ground or wait for the nuts inside the husk to fall out of the husk on the ground. You will never find any nuts that way. The squirrels and chipmunks will get all of them before you do. So you want to gather the nuts still in the husk on the plant as close to ripe as possible. And in Southern New England, that time is the second week of September. So it may vary where you are, but that's the time when I go out and gather them. And the place that I gather them from the wild is under power lines. And I don't think it's the electromagnetic radiation. I think it's all the sun the plants are getting. And the fact that these corridors are so wide, it's hard for the squirrels and the chipmunks to work these bushes assiduously and eat every nut as it ripens because it's scary out there. There's foxes, there's hawks, there's other things that try to eat them. And so they're not working these bushes very hard, which means more nuts are left on for longer. So humans, we can get our share too. So, um, and if you want to grow hazelnuts from seed, which is what I do, do not let the hazelnuts grow out because they're hydrophilic. This is true with any nut as far as I know. Don't let them dry out if you want to grow a plant from them. If you want to eat them, yes, let them dry out.
And as I explained before, use that hardware cloth to prevent the nuts from uh, getting marauded by the ravenous rodents. So acorns, all oaks produce acorns. All acorns are edible. There's some variation, the level of tannic acid in the acorns. Um, uh, and basically for any acorn, you've got to leach it at least a little bit to reduce the tannic acid levels of the acorn nut meats and anything you make from them is palatable. Uh, I prefer the acorns from the white oak acorn group. Some people prefer the acorns from the red oak acorn group. I think we can disagree to dis uh, we can agree to disagree about that. Uh, there's strong arguments on both sides as to which you want to go with. Uh, I find that when I leach the tannic acid out with the white oak acorns, there's enough acorn flavor left in the nut meal, so you get that wonderful, distinctively flavored acorn flavor uh, persisting in your baked products. So if you want to grow white oaks from seed though, this is the trick, is white oak acorns start to sprout soon after they hit the ground. So this is a, a, a nut that you can't stratify, you can't store, you really have to sow it soon after you gather it. Because if you try to sow it, uh, like uh, these I had in my stratification fridge, these roots all rotted because uh, I didn't get them in the ground. So uh, that's one uh, uh, tip I'll give you if you want to grow acorns. All right, we've gotten to my number one favorite edible species out of everything. It's the shag bark hickory. Whoop, let me go back up here. So this is what the bark looks like. This isn't a seasonal phenomenon. So anytime you see a tree like this, keep track of where it is. And the time to check it and look for the nuts is from mid-September until the end of October. That's the time. And the nuts fruit in a bell curve. So it's the middle of that time period, like end of September, beginning of October, when you're most likely to find the nuts. And so this is what the nuts look like. They're enclosed in a green four-parted husk. This part often bursts off the nut when the nuts fall off the tree onto the ground. So that's what they look like inside the husk. That's what they look like attached to the tree. You do not have to pick these off the tree. Wait till they hit the ground. Don't wait too long because the squirrels and chipmunks will eventually take all of them. But I've gathered thousands of hickory nuts under trees and basically look for spots that are kind of farmy where the trees are growing on the edge of a road, on the edge of a field, on the middle of a field, and especially where there's a whole bunch of trees together, like where you find like a half a dozen trees along the roadside. And that's a place when the trees are having an on year and really producing, uh, the trees will produce thousands of nuts and will totally overwhelm the capacity of the squirrels and chipmunks to gather all of them. So there'll be plenty for you too. So here's a maple hickory nut pie. This is a New England version of pecan pie. This recipe is in my book. Virtually everybody I serve this to prefer it over pecan pie. And um, it does take a cup and three quarters of shelled hickory nuts. So that's a lot. And, um, but it is a really fun thing to serve. As I said, the recipes in my book. And then I have recipes for some of these cookies online. So we're us to be doing a live program. I would have made uh, one of these cookies for you. Uh, and uh, they're really yummy with shagbark hickory nuts. And yes, I love to grow shagbark hickory from seed because I love the species so much. So uh, stratify the nuts for at least six months, keep them in cold storage, and then you can pull them out of stratification so they'll begin to sprout, then you can sow them. And I'm growing them in these 14 inch tall tree pots because these trees develop very long tap roots right away. And so give the root room to grow. And yes, there's the hardware cloth to prevent the nuts from being marauded. And, uh, and then you can plant them out in the landscape. All right, here's black walnut. You do not have to pick these nuts off the tree either. Wait till they hit the ground and then they're gonna look like old green tennis balls. And you have to get this uh, smelly part off, which is a bit of a chore, I will admit that. And they will stain your fingers brown if you do it with your bare hands. And then once you get the outer part off, that's what the nuts look like. Then it's a challenge to get these shells open. They're very hard, so you can use a rock or a hammer or a vise, which is a good device to use. Here's the device I use. I got this from a company in Oklahoma, and, uh, and you just uh, pull down on the lever and big pieces come out of the shells that way. And black walnuts don't taste like the store-bought English walnuts at all. They have their own unique assertive flavor, which I think pairs really well with honey. So like black walnut baklava is really good. This black walnut honey square is another thing I like to make for my in-person programs is really good. All right, here's a bunch of other plants. These are all edible trees I don't have time to talk about today. Sorry about that. Uh, I might have slide about Tupelo. Yeah, so Tupelo is a native species with edible fruit. This fruit is very uh, small. It's about the size of a jelly bean and it's very sour. Um, 
but it's a fun thing to nibble on. And uh, that's what the seed looks like after you take the um, uh, fruit pulp off with your mouth is how I like to do it. And then yes, you can sow it. And yes, the, the seed will sprout in your fridge and sow that seed and then the uh, seed will grow in your pots wherever you sow it. All right, ground nut, the main edible part on a ground nut are these tubers. And I've grown this species from the tubers and also from um, the um, uh, little beans in the little pods. And this is a native species that was very important food to the Native Americans and to the early colonists. And, uh, and D Acres is growing this in the midst of all their other plants. So it's very compatible in a permaculture situation. Just beware that you have to dig these tubers out to extract them. So if you've got other things growing in the midst of them, you might disturb those others too. So uh, one guy I know in a whiskey barrel, he'll grow Jerusalem artichokes and groundnuts together and just dump the entire contents of the barrel out at the end of the growing season to harvest the groundnuts and the uh, Jerusalem artichokes that way. Yes, yeah, so one way to eat groundnuts is just to fry them in a little vegetable oil and make these uh, uh, groundnut chips. They're quite good that way. And hog peanut is another species. If you have shade, damp shade, these peanuts are, are much more diminutive than the groundnuts, and they're seasonal. They're only going to be out during the end of the growing season and the dormant period, so they're not out now. Uh, but it's another species that um, uh, some mention was uh, named uh, um, Jonathan, who runs his food forest farm uh, out in, uh, he's now in central New York. He was one of the, the uh, uh, um, uh, Holyoke Mass guys with Eric Tonesmeyer, Jonathan Bates. So I think this might even be a picture I took from him. So he knows about this hog peanut. Yes, yeah, so you can grow hog peanut from the little seeds and they're in these cute little uh, pods like that. Yeah, so here's the hog peanut with a hardware cloth on top growing in my nursery. And Jerusalem artichoke, which is native to the Midwest, but it was here in New England in 1620 because our indigenous peoples of this region traded for it. And so the patches where Jerusalem artichoke occurs in the wild in New England may have been descended from patches that were originally established by Native Americans. So that's pretty cool. And, the, and here's what you eat on a Jerusalem artichoke. These tubers, you can treat them most ways you choose the potatoes. You can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them, and so on. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I'm growing plants and planting them out in the landscape. So as mentioned before, I'm playing this role of Johnny Appleseed. I've set up this nursery and I'm partnering with a bunch of groups to plant stuff for my nursery. So here's an example of a few of my projects. So I gave you a link to this uh, table. I'm just going to stand up because I have a leg cramp here. I'm just going to stand up. You can look at this table while uh, I'm doing this. So anyway, this information is available online. Uh, it's a list of the uh, more than 180 spe species I'm aware of that are native to the eco-regions of the Northeast U.S. and adjacent areas in Canada that are also edible by people. So this is, so it's a subset of this list that I'm growing. And here's a, a photo from my nursery. Uh, you can see it's not a retail operation. I haven't got everything nicely organized and labeled. I'm growing plants here uh, to give away for planting of public conservation land and other sites where the public can interact with them uh, mostly. So I'm not selling anything at this nursery. There's another section of my nursery with uh, plants there. Here's my stratification fridge, which is much neater than it was in this photo where I store seed and where, as I say, yeah, I check them to see seeds that have sprouted, sow them. Here's a list of projects. Uh, uh, this is maybe half of what I've done. I'm not gonna uh, dwell on this right now. I'm just gonna go through a few examples where I planted plants. So here's an island owned by a land trust off the shore of Marblehead, Mass, that I identified some good beach plum habitat on. I bought some plants. I worked with some volunteers. We took the plants out at low tide to plant these plants in places I had identified for beach plums there. And I'd be lying if I told you that every single plant we put in is thriving. Some of them died. And this is one of my earliest projects. So I write it off as a beginner mistake that I hope I am, uh, am a little bit more informed now about recognizing the best places to put in beach plums and the best way to plant them so I'd have a little bit more chances of success in the future. Here's another plant, uh, another island off the shore of Salem, Mass. I've done some edible native plants to further supplement the plants that are already out there. Here's a, a project down south of Boston, another barrier island where I added some native edibles to that landscape. 
Here's a paddle access point to the Connecticut River maintained by our state parks agency and the Appalachian Mountain Club. And they heard what I was doing. They said, Russ, plant some edible native plants around the tent platform. So I did. So now when people use these platforms, they can supplement the GORP and the other uh, uh, food they brought in with uh, native edibles that are growing on the sites. And here's one of the other sites in uh, Montague, Mass. So I've done a lot of partnering with Native American groups. So here is Ferris Gray, who uh, came to my nursery and loaded up his car with native plants, which they planted at a ceremonial site on tribal property south of Boston in the Blue Hills. Uh, here's a site in Western Mass, a great site to visit called Riverwalk that's publicly accessible. It's open to the public right now. So if you find yourself in the Berkshires, it's a great example of how a citizen volunteer group with sweat equity went in and took a rubble strewn eyesore neglected area of riverbank and they pulled out the rubble they pulled out the invasive species planted it all up with natives like these ostrich ferns right there and uh, turned it into just a spectacular place to walk um, and i've added native edibles to this landscape too and i did a native edible walk there this spring which is online so if you're interested in that you have any trouble finding it let me know and i will point you to it uh, here's a project down in buzzards bay where i added edible marsh marigolds to landscape there here's a project i did in a suburb near me lexington massachusetts where they did a daylighting project and we just planted a bunch of edible wild plants in the project area that had been disturbed by the construction so here's the flowering raspberry deployed in the landscape where I found a dappled sunlight uh, area and the plant is thriving. Here's a project in Maine, the Maine Audubon Society plant uh, uh, property where they don't want you going in and picking things here, but it's a great place for people to encounter these edible, edible natives that we've added to the landscape and see them and say, hey, uh, that's a great plant. Maybe I should consider that for my yard. So here's a spike dart plant. This is a plant that grows wild on its own at D acres. Uh, and uh, we planted one here in the kind of habitat it likes and it's thriving, which is really great. Here's another project at an organic farm where I've supplemented the landscape with edible native plants. Uh, and uh, finally, D acres. So I was just there three days ago and I continued this tradition, which is going for several years now, uh, visiting Josh and enjoying that wonderful place that has 95 species of edible wild plants, plus of course, the wonderful conventional organic vegetables. And so this is a shot from just a few days ago with Josh with his mask on, which we had to do, be safe. and. He is weeding a shagbark hickory tree that I brought up to him. And so this is one year later after we planted it. So these are slow growing and it's gonna take 20 years probably for this tree to be big enough to start produce uh, nuts that we can harvest. But as you may know, the famous Chinese saying is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and the second best time is now. So let's all plant the trees now. And, um, and I got reminded about what a cool idea it is to use the cardboard for mulching around plants, which of course you all know well, but which native plant uh, planters, I don't think they're thinking about this technique, is a great way to give your plant a head start so it can get big enough. So when the other competing plants eventually sneak in in this area, the tree is now well established enough that the uh, competing plants won't harm it. All right, yeah, so I should have put that word up. So there's the words that go with that slide right there. And yeah, so here's one of the woofer volunteers that helped us plant the Pycnanthema muticum at the side of the acres. This was just a few years ago. And with that, here's the uh, uh, second to last shot of my slide. Uh, here's a great book that I would recommend if you wanna learn more about edible native plants, especially about the wildlife that utilize edible native species this book is really great. It was written by two guys from Cincinnati, so their primary focus is to get people to shift off of conventional agriculture and start going to permaculture. Uh, and um, I'm not sure that's as much of where our work needs to happen in the Northeast, because uh, uh, you know, growing regular farms like organic farms that are growing row crops of things, I think that's an important source of food too. But at the very least in places where we can do edible, na edible native landscaping that is complementary to uh, the food we're already growing, I think this is a, a great uh, resource for that. 
Okay, last slide. I'm about to take questions. Uh, here's the book I keep mentioning. So uh, you will see if you're an astute observer, non-native plants on this book, because as I mentioned before, when I'm foraging, I'm happily foraging for weeds, invasive species. So this book covers lots of edible things in addition to edible native plants. So here's a strawberry knotweed pie I make from Japanese knotweed. Here's autumn olive uh, that produces delicious edible fruit. Um, here's black locust that I mentioned earlier in my show. So there's chapters on these and, and many other plants in this book. And here's information on how to get the book. And here's how to find me online. So with that, I am happy to take any questions that came in. And thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about my favorite subject. Wow. Thank you so much, Russ. I am learning so much. This is so great. All right. I'm going to ask you the first question. Um, do you know if... You can use Virginia creeper leaves for stuffing. For oh, stuff I don't think so. Uh, the berries are poisonous and, uh, you know, not eat one berry, you're going to die instantly poisonous. But it is, it's not, as far as I know, I don't know of any documented instance where Virginia creeper leaves have been used for stuffing. So, uh, so I can't, I, I can't say that that's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And then how do you remove shag bark from shell oh, and have them stay yes. whole? Is there Good a special? Question. Okay. All right. So let me go, let me share again and go back to my show and go awesome. back to that slide. Perfect. Okay. All right. So share. Yes, share. Oops. All right. So let's go. Uh, no, no, no. I don't have to do. What is this? Sorry, guys. Let me hold on just a second. I'm going to get this to happen. All right. So, all right, why aren't you going up slide-wise? Okay, yeah, here we go. All right, I should have anticipated that question and been all queued up to show you, but <laughs> I'm almost there, almost there, almost there. Bear with me, I'm probably getting vertigo from looking at these slides. All right, so, so here is a shag bark hickory nut. Look at these beautiful pieces that I extracted from nuts like this. How did I do that? So what you do is you turn the nut on its side where the points are coming out like this and the steep part of the shell is up and down like that and you hit straight here with a hammer and you don't hit it really hard to pulverize the shell you just hit it hard enough to send cracks through the shell right up here just tap right here till you send cracks through the shell and more often than not the shells open right up and you get entire halves out like that. So that's the secret for getting it open. Now, I would be misleading you if I told you I never had to use a nut pick. I use a nut pick. And actually, what I use are dental tools, uh, which you can get from science supply stores because hobbyists use them a lot. And that's even better than a conventional nut pick from extracting the pieces out of the shell. So that's my secret on how to get shag bark hickory nuts open. Awesome. Thank you. Trick, tricks of the trade. Um, we have a question from Ruth. Elix Glabra, I have read limited sources on leaves for tea by Native Americans. Are you familiar? Yes. So, so this is uh, the plant that she's mentioning. I think the common name is inkberry. So I do not have, know of any species in that genus that is edible that is native to New England. The plant that's used for tea is called yaupon. And the botanical name for it is Ilex vomitoria, which it has that uh, name because I believe indigenous peoples as a ritualistic pra uh, practice would drink so much of that tea that uh, it would adversely affect them. Uh, and uh, possibly, you know, they would have, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, psychotropic principles from drinking so much of it because it is one of our native to North America species that has caffeine in it. Uh, as far as I know, it's not hardy to New England, uh, but, uh, but you know, permaculture farms from the mid-Atlantic southward could probably grow it in a protected microclimate. Awesome. I have a question for you, Russ. Um, so I am currently on a property that has been logged uh, different capacities over the last couple hundred years and so in various patches of the property there's different levels of succession going on um, I'd love to have you there but I'm just wondering do you 
what would it take to get you up here? Or um, do you offer a consultation? Um, or Yeah, you know? so, so, um, so this, <laughs> this is a very unusual year. In a typical year, I'm doing 40 in-person programs. Uh, and so I'm not stingy with my time. People can usually track me down. So in fact, thank you for mentioning this. We have the best of intentions of having a live in-person program where I walk around D Acres in September. So uh, do Woo-hoo. go to the D Acres website and keep an eye on that. And if we don't have an awful phase two where we've got to lock down again and we can't do things like that and things are relaxed enough that we can have a very small scale in-person program where everybody's wearing masks, including me, uh, our intention is to have a live person program at D Acres, which uh, it's not going to your individual property and telling you what you have edible and what's suitable for growing on your own yard. Sorry about that, but at least uh, you would get to see the plants in person and learn them even better than you can learn from a, a webinar like what we're doing today. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, oh, here's a question from Joshua. He says, okay, did you talk about cultivating bulrushes in a landscape and any high protein forages for fowl? Yeah, so uh, I did not talk about bulrush. Um, Bulrush is an edible native plant that grows, actually there's many species of bulrush. It's the great bulrush that would be the best one for eating because the edible parts would be the largest. Um, but, uh, you know, I covered 35 species today. That's pretty good in the allotted time I had for me. There's over 180, so I could have easily had a weekend long program just covering everything. So sorry about the species I wasn't able to get to today and bulrush is one of them. If I were to think of a species I know of that uh, I didn't talk about today because I'm not aware of uh, a lot of growing uh, on individual permaculture farms or house lots is wild rice. So wild rice is an important forage food for waterfowl and it's absolutely compatible with har- humans harvesting it for food, especially if you do it in the traditional way. It's done by the indigenous tribes of the upper Midwest, which is where I buy my wild rice from the Ojibwe Indian tribe that are gathering in the traditional way in the canoes in the lakes in northern Minnesota, where they uh, paddle into the uh, wild rice patches when the grains are ripe. And with one knocker, one stick, they bend the plant over the boat and with the other knocker, the other stick, they uh, strike the wild rice plant and it knocks the grains into the bottom of the boat and some grains fall into the water, which is great because those are the grains that are available for waterfowl, those are the grains that are available to grow new wild rice plants. So it's a technique that's been used for millennia that has proved to be very solid, sustainable technique. So that's a species I can think of off the top of my head that uh, is edible by people good waterfowl forage, uh, wild rice. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Wondering if you would be willing to share where you bought the nutcracker that you used for black walnut. So I have some (laughs) possibly bad news on that is I'm not sure that company, which is a company in Oklahoma, still exists. But I have gone online and seen uh, black walnut nutcrackers that are like that. And so uh, this show is being recorded. And so you can go back to that slide, take a good look at that nutcracker, and then uh, type in black walnut nutcracker into Google and hit the images button. And you'll get a whole bunch of pictures and just click on one that is the closest looking to what I use. And hopefully you'll get a device that's quite similar to the one I use that will work well for you. Yeah, it doesn't sound like you have much free time, Russ, but if you wanted to, I'm sure there's a niche you could fill to um, start manufacturing your own nutcrackers. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm a plant person. I'm not a metallurgist. <laughs> you know, I'm not a welder. Uh, you know, in a, in, you know, a permaculture transition town's uh, utopia, of course, we'd know who the person was in the neighborhood or the community or down the street that could do something like that and would. And I would happily barter with a bunch of nuts in exchange for a nutcracker. And I'm sure, you know, that's 
something to think about uh, into the future as we figure out how to uh, be resilient uh, setting up networks like that. A question coming in from Colin. Will caterpillars grow on any size native tree to serve as bird food sources? For example, keeping a tree pruned to a small manageable size from 10 to 20 feet on a small property. Yes, because uh, uh, a butterfly will find the plant. If it's what they want, you know, for the food for their caterpillar, they can find it no matter how big it is. So even if it's a few feet tall to 30, 40, 50 feet tall, they can find it. Uh, there is an argument to be made for planting a lot of something, which is a technique that landscape architects use where they'll plant something in masses just because they think it looks better to see a whole bunch of something blooming together, whatever. I think an argument could be made for doing that if you really want the pollinators or the butterflies to find plants, instead of putting just one or two out, I could see an argument that putting a dozen out, if you have the space, might increase the likelihood that they would find it. I was at a site in Rhode Island yesterday where I led an in-person wild edibles walk. This is uh, one of my planting sites, uh, Claire McIntosh Wildlife Refuge. It's an Audubon Society Rhode Island property uh, in Bristol, Rhode Island, where there's also a pollinator garden where there are hundreds of Monarda fistulosa plants planted out and hundreds of the um, uh, uh, the Pycnanthema muticum, the uh, uh, mountain mint planted out. And there I just saw the butterflies descending on it and the other pollinators descending on it like it was a cruise ship buffet. Uh, they were really picking out. And so, yes, but even if you had just one and even if it were small, uh, it's still value to pollinators and caterpillars and stuff like that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, might have time for one more question. Let's see. So for what culinary applications or uses might wild fruit be better than conventional counterparts? All right. Good question. So because when we think about yummy fruits, we tend to focus on eating a fruit raw. And yes, cultivated fruit often is bigger and yummier raw than wild fruit. But one area where wild fruit excels over cultivated fruit is jelly making because the robustness of the flavor of a wild fruit that might be a little bit too puckery or astringent or sour to tolerate as a raw fruit stands up to the jelly making process and makes a much more interesting final product. So a great example of that is crab apple jelly. The crab apple jelly has got a lot more character to it than just plain old apple jelly. But a lot of the fruits that, uh, that I'm growing that you can find out in the wild make an excellent jelly, like choke cherry makes an excellent jelly. Uh, and, and uh, so do many other of the wild fruits. And, and beach plum, of course, beach plum jam is probably uh, uh, the most uh, popular use for that fruit. Excellent. Thank you, Russ. Um, we're about out of time, but so I did post, I'm gonna copy and paste it again. I posted the name of your book in the chat um and i was trying to find a non-amazon uh oh oh yes okay so let me pull up that uh let me share my screen here okay and let me just go to that slide all right yes i'm sharing screen okay there we go so i'm just gonna go to that info in that slide and help you because um Thank you. <laughs> sorry there is a better way of doing this and i'm just uh doing it this way i'm sorry about this oh there it was okay we get to look at your pictures again it's all awesome. right there we go okay so so this book my book was published by a land trust the essex county greenbelt association and let me just get this out of the way and uh, I should have mentioned this they allow foraging as a permitted activity in all their properties that are open to the public which is really great and in gratitude for that I give them all the money from the book sales. So if you buy a book, however you get it, they get the money. And I told them just buy more land with it, just create more foraging opportunities for all of us with the money. So, um, so you can contact Alexandra and uh, order a book directly from Greenbelt. Or if you want it sent directly to you, there's a used bookstore that carries them and you just B Street Books, you contact them and they will mail it to you. So that's how you can uh, get a book that does not involve Amazon. Awesome. Thank you. 
Thank you. And thank yeah, for that backstory. That's, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do in our community, our ecological community and the humans that are a part of that. <laughs> um, thank you, Russ. I, that was just incredible. Um, you got a lot of information in there. I'm excited to, uh, I'm going to definitely go to D acres. I'm going to keep myself informed and hopefully I'll, I'll see you in September. Um, so thanks again to Russ. This is the end of the convergence. Um, I can't believe it. Um, keep in mind a year from now, we are hoping to do an in-person convergence at the acres. So I hope to see you all then. Um, until then keep in touch. I want to thank all of our presenters. I want to thank the other organizers of this event who had to pivot um, a couple months ago to shift to an online format just to kind of serve some of the, or to um, help perpetuate some of the momentum and excitement that we've created to bring back the convergence. Again, our last convergence was in 2014 in this region. Um, I want to thank all of the participants and attendees and uh, for, for being a part of this but also just for all the amazing work that you're doing um, in our region, our bioregion, to kind of um, protect our ecosystems. And without further ado, that's all I have for you all. Again, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekends. I know it's hot out there today, probably in this entire region.